Right, stand here, stand here, stand here. Stay here. Right, so we're told here, I know what's going to happen to you now, mate. Well, I know it's going to happen to you go to prison, obviously, but again. Why, what have you done? Have you done something to anyone else? Yeah. What have you done? I've murdered four people. This is Damien Bendel. A violent man with a long and dark history with the law. And at the time that this body cam footage took place, he already had more than a decade of charges and convictions under his belt. It's a shame that, on his final day as a free man, he would commit a crime so terrible that he would become one of Britain's most hated criminals and be handed the harshest sentence possible under current UK law. This video walks you through the terrible life of Damien Bendel, the lives lost through his actions, and the the many mistakes and glaring red flags that were found along the way. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime folks, my name is Adrian, and today I'm back with another darkly fascinating story, but this one is particularly gruesome. You see, Damien can only be described as one of the most deplorable men in human history, and after hearing all of the details in this video, I'm sure you will agree. Oh, and by the way, I've got a bunch of very exciting projects in the pipeline, so if you want to keep updated with what they are, or simply love to caffeinate while you investigate, please consider subscribing. Anyway, with all of that out the way, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Damien Bendel. Welcome to Merry Old England, folks. Our story today pulls us to the county of Derbyshire. Nestled in the northeast of this historic county, and you will find the village of Killer Marsh. And unfortunately, it does live up to its name in this video. Just over two square miles in size, you won't find Killer Marsh to be a big or bustling city. It's home to just under 10,000 people, and is surrounded by many fields and lakes. There are mentions of this town dating as far back as 1086, making this place very rich in history. As with many settlements in this part of the country, Killamarsh's economy was primarily driven by agriculture until the 1400s, which of course is when mining then took over to become its leading industry. Despite coal mining thriving for numerous centuries and playing a vital role in the growth of the village's population, it gradually declined in the 1980s as a majority of British coal mines started to undergo gradual closure. You can find the Rotha Valley County Park near one of these mines, which provides 740 acres of beautiful landscape to explore and experience. Or maybe, if you're looking for something a little less rural, you could walk along the canal paths that snake through the village. For cyclists, and especially mountain bikers, this really does seem like the place to be. Killamarsh offers various tracks and trails of various difficulty and caliber. Many in the local area know of this, and these tracks usually serve as the most famous thing about Killamarsh. However, in September of 2021, all of that changed. At 7.26am on Sunday the 19th of September 2021, emergency services received a phone call from a man named Damien Bendel. The phone call was short, and Damien's request quite abrupt. As for what he said, I'll let you listen. Um, basically I need the police in the ambulance and that, because um, I've killed four people. Okay, just hold the line. Bear with me. Being a relatively small village, it did not take long for officers to arrive. Responding at the scene 14 minutes later, they were faced with a calm yet dishevelled man in a trench coat. This being Damien Bendel, the one to call 999. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Alright, come, come, come to me. Right, Mate, have you got yeah. anything on you that you shouldn't have? No, there's no weapons or nothing. Right, right do you want to undo your coat? Have you, have, have, you, have you armed yourself? Yeah. You have. Have, you, have you got? A, have you stabbed yourself, mate? Yeah. I can see I can see blood on your hands. Yeah. Anywhere else? Just my chest, uh, four inches in with a with a bread knife. Can we have a look? And, yeah, and one on the stomach. I bled quite. All right, do you want? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. no, 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 just stay there. Stay there. Just I just don't, don't want to be in front of her. All right. Giving him the courtesy of stepping around the corner and away from prying eyes. Officers soon learned that Damien was not lying. He had murdered four people in the home behind him and he had multiple wounds to prove it. After clarifying his actions, Damien Bendel was handcuffed while officers called for backup and prepared to search the property. After stepping inside, they would find the bodies of 35-year-old Terry Harris and three children. And tragically, all four were pronounced dead at the scene. Terry was found in the living room, 
with 13-year-old John Paul Burnett found in the bathroom, and Lacey Burnett and her friend Connie Gent in the bedroom. Lacey and Connie were both only 11 years old. Blood was observed throughout the property, and a claw hammer was found alongside a bread knife in the kitchen. And, as you can imagine, after these findings, Damien was arrested immediately. Damien, it's 0747 hours, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Do not mention when questioned something like relying on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Your arrest is necessary to protect you from harm, to prevent your disappearance, for a prompt and effective investigation. Okay? We're going to get you out, we're going to put you in the back of the van. Stand up. This incident rocked the community of Killamarsh. In fact, this village had never faced a murder before in recorded history. And now, all of a sudden, they were dealing with four. The household's unusual situation meant that many families were affected too. None of these children were actually biologically related to Damien. And as for his relationship with Terry Marsh, they'd only formed one several months prior. And Connie Gent, who wasn't related to anyone in the household at all, was merely staying overnight to stay with a friend. This was a tragedy that no one could see coming. As always, the devil is in the detail, and as you'll soon come to find out, there were many glaring red flags prior to the murders taking place. And, unfortunately, Damien would do far worse than just murder. It was later discovered that Damien had taken advantage of 11-year-old Lacey as she lay there dying, and would even come back for a second time once she had passed away making this one of the most disgusting and sadistic murders imaginable. But before we continue with Damien's horrific actions, let's first understand how we got here in the first place. And that begins with the lives of Terry Harris and her children. Described as caring and loving, Terry Harris was born in London to her parents Angela Smith and Lawrence Harris. Growing up in the East End, she was a city girl by nature but at the age of 17, she moved to Sheffield with her mother. Around the same time, her father moved to Essex, leaving Terry with two homes 200 miles apart. It was during her time in Sheffield that Terry eventually caught the attention of a man named Jason Bennett. Fast forward several years, and the two had welcomed two beautiful children into the world, that being John Paul and Lacey Bennett. Lacey was described as a compassionate young girl who loved to perform. She enjoyed making TikTok videos with her friends, and was attending dance class at school. As for her older brother, John Paul was described as a calm boy who loved his family. Both children attended Outwood Academy City School and were very popular with good grades. Now Terry was smitten with her children. She poured her heart and soul into caring for them and being a good mother and it's quite evident that she was one too. This came quite naturally for her too, because as a care worker, she was both professionally and naturally sensitive, understanding, and patient. And as for Jason, he was a great father as well. But sadly, after 15 years together, they would unfortunately divorce. Now, as always, this did leave the family with both grief and separation, but both parents did their very best to keep their children happy and Jason would keep in regular contact with his children daily. And Terry had another love in her life anyway, that being West Ham Football Club. Terry felt the void that many single adults feel. I mean, she loved her children, but she also desired to be looked after too. And so, with that in mind, in the year 2020, she began to look for a new partner. She turned to the world of dating apps, a reasonably common way to find love in the modern world. And it's here that, unfortunately, she connected with a man and none other than Damien Bendel. As you can already tell from this story, Terry was what almost everyone would describe as a good person. She was an average young mother who loved her children and wanted to be loved back. Unfortunately for her though, Damien would turn out to be the total opposite. Following several conversations, the pair would eventually fall for each other. At the time, she was living in Woodhouse in Sheffield, but by the start of 2021, she would move to Chandos Crescent in Killamarsh with her children and Damien Bendel. But who was Damien exactly? Born in the year 1989, Damien was raised in Swindon, and unfortunately, seemed to weave his path of destruction from a very young age. And for reasons unknown to the rational citizen, he was determined to earn a reputation as a hard man in the local area. But the reality was that almost 
everything about Damien was actually a total facade. He was involved in criminal enterprise and petty crime from a young age, and as soon as he was set on this path, it all seemed to snowball over the years. Those who knew Damien when he was younger would later say that his main objective was being seen as dangerous rather than being anything of the sort, and his sporadic efforts as a cage fighter, which he often failed at by the way, were proof of this. He also had true blue tattooed across his knuckles, the motto of famous London football club Chelsea. However, despite the relatively short journey away from home, he had never actually seen them play in person. It is also reported that Damien has several Nazi tattoos on his legs, but it is generally understood that he could not tell you anything about the Third Reich or their ideologies. In other words, he was just an attention-seeking bad boy. In addition to this, Damien often boasted about killing his friend's dog. When his mate couldn't afford to have her put down, Damien said, quote, he'd do it for free with a brick. Now, hopefully, this is merely another one of his made-up stories to appear tough, but concerningly, numerous friends around Swindon do claim that this happened. To make matters even worse, he was known to have enjoyed torturing kittens. This comes up now and again in my videos, but killing animals is one of the most noticeable hallmarks of a murderer. Damien had also diagnosed himself to have multiple personalities, admitted that he was prone to snapping at the moment, and often gave people a three-warning system. In other words, people would be in big trouble if they ever crossed him three times. Based on what I have told you so far, you can probably guess that this man had long-standing issues with alcohol and drug abuse. Damien had no control over his habits, actions, or his behaviour, and so he was constantly in trouble with the law. This included several charges, including attempted robbery, armed robbery, robbery in possession of a knife, inflicting grievous bodily harm, and assault. One of these incidents occurred in the year 2015 when he tried to rob a local shop with a knife. But going back to how this man was all bark and no bite, he then ran away when the elderly shopkeeper chased him out with a golf club. It is worth highlighting here that, although Damien's violent history should be taken very seriously, Terry initially had no idea about any of this and that's thanks to the mask he wore online. We all know this already, but the internet is filled with liars, narcissists, and murderers who can all create the illusion that they are good, happy, successful people. Now, all of this is particularly pertinent on social media, but the one place where it is extremely dangerous is, of course, dating apps because that's where you get very close to other people. Now, Damien may have seemed like a caring, attentive, and charming young man, but in reality, he was a poor excuse of a human being one with a violent history behind him, and unfortunately, he would worm his way into Terry's life. A mere few months into their relationship, friends close to Terry began to voice their concerns about Damien. His violent nature had slipped down the grapevine, with rumours of charges and convictions circling the family household. Now, Terry's mother was extremely worried by this, and would often beg her daughter to reconsider the relationship. She was worried about what he could do under the wrong circumstances, and unfortunately, that gut instinct was right. But Terry believed that she could change Damien for the better. She was a loving, caring, and kind woman who saw the best in everyone. And although she recognized that Damien did have a bad side to him, she believed that he merely needed the right environment to thrive. And sadly, in the month of September 2020, only five months after connecting with Damien, Terry would move to Killamarsh, and he would move in with her. Now, Swindon was a long way away from Sheffield and the village of Killamarsh, and moving 200 miles up north for a partner you had only recently met on Tinder is a huge red flag in itself. But saying that, it is quite easy to understand how Terry felt special from this. Now, one of the main contributing factors behind this is also probably because she became Became pregnant in recent months. And with a child on the way, she likely believed that her new partner would smarten up and become a good father. Circling back to Damien's dependency on drugs, even his time behind bars was laced with problems. According to cellmates, he was often high on drugs and couldn't even function properly. For those of you who aren't aware, Spice is a synthetic marijuana that, quite bluntly, should be avoided at all costs. 
I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but it's quite an epidemic here in the UK. I think I'll just stick to coffee instead. Upon relocating to Terry's home found in Killamarsh, Damien was already under probation for arson-related charges and had to report to an officer weekly. And furthermore, he was required to wear an electronic ankle bracelet and stay in the property at all times. One aspect that I find very concerning about this case is that Damien was bailed into the home which already had two young children, neither of which were even related to him. I mean, colour me cautious, but I believe that's an oversight. Now, given his long and violent history, you would have thought that these probation officers would have reconsidered their decision but sadly, they never thought about it. His conviction of arson was yet another terrible decision made while under the influence of horrible drugs. In the several years leading up to 2021, he had become heavily addicted to cocaine, marijuana, spice, methamphetamine, and even morphine. And although Damien claimed that he was clean from drugs, this was not actually the case. Sadly, it would become undeniable on the final day of Terry's life. September the 18th, 2021. It was a Saturday, and the Harris Bendel household had a busy weekend ahead. The entire family were at home, with the addition of Lacey's friend, Connie Gent. The two young girls were motivated to raise money for cancer awareness. As a result, they'd put together a bunch of cakes and sweets and sold them at a local park stall. Tragically, unknown to anyone at the time, this would be the final picture of them alive. Just hours later, both girls would be dead. The reason for this would be Damien Bendel, because after finishing his stockpile of weed and alcohol, he then consumed three to four bags of cocaine throughout the rest of the day, apparently leading to an eventual blackout. And after exhausting this supply too, he then attempted to reach his dealer to purchase even more. But after making multiple calls without any success, he then began to lose his temper. And tragically, at this very moment, he lost grasp on any reason and rationality that he had. Based on mobile phone data, it is believed that the following actions happened over an 18-minute time span. After locating and grabbing his claw hammer, Damien attacked Terry. As a result, she was murdered in cold blood in the living room, killing her unborn child in the process. After this, he then marched upstairs found John Paul in the bathroom, and murdered him too. Damien then murdered Connie before attacking, abusing, and murdering Lacey. Disgustingly, autopsy reports suggest that this abuse occurred more than once throughout the night. And to make matters even worse, he positioned a mirror in the room so he could watch himself do it. By 6am the following morning, he had grabbed John Paul's Xbox and left the property, hoping to sell it in exchange for more drugs. During this time frame, phone records show that he once again tried to contact his dealer. Damien then phoned a cab driver, waited for him to arrive, and made his way to the dealer. And when he was asked by the cab driver how his evening was going, he said, not too bad, a bit mad. A surveillance camera captured him walking around the streets of Sheffield with an Xbox in hand. Shortly after this, he then returned home. After arriving back at Chandos Crescent, he called his mother for a conversation while going to a convenience store, and surveillance cameras located inside the store show him buying a pack of cigarettes with blood clearly visible on his hands. He then returned home, weakly attempted to take his own life with a bread knife, and then dialed 999. And while on the phone to emergency services, he said, the whole house is covered in claret. I used a hammer. Obviously, I'm going to prison because I murdered four people. I bet you don't get four murders in Killamarsh, do you? And as we know, that is when officers intervened at the property. I hate to say it, but I told you that this story would get much worse in detail. And if you already think that Damien is a twisted man, well, unfortunately, I have more terrible news. You see, Damien was not one to hide from the truth. In fact, he seemed to be quite confident when openly confessing that he'd murdered an entire family to officers. And with his partner being pregnant with his baby at the time of murdering her, he would then cheekily ask with a grin on his face if technically he'd murdered four people 
or five. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, Damien would make his first appearance at Derby Crown Court only six days later, that being on September the 24th, 2021. Fast forward 15 months to December the 21st, 2022, he was found guilty on four counts of murder and one count of sexual assault. As a result, Damien Bendel was sentenced to a whole life term, meaning under no circumstances will he ever be released from prison. It is important to note Note here that whole life sentences are extremely rare in British law, and are only given to the most vile of criminals. Whole life sentences are only ever applied when there is a belief that there is no chance that the accused would ever be rehabilitated. And while this sounds like a relatively sensible and reasonable option to the average citizen, this sentence is often legally challenged. But what was most surprising about this case was the results of an inquest that reviewed the probation system, and whether any failings or faults had occurred in the process. The inquest concluded that there were 51 distinct failures which played a role in Damien Bendel being outside of prison and permitted to reside at Terry's and her children's home. And despite previous allegations of an inappropriate relationship with a 16-year-old foster care girl, this information was inaccurately recorded and not reported during his probation assessment. Even more concerning, when Damien, who was mandated to wear an electronic tag, openly expressed a threat to kill his partner and children if the relationship soured, the officer responsible for tagging him chose not to report it. Had this information been known, he would have almost definitely been prohibited from staying at the same address. Another significant contributing factor was misclassifying his risk level as medium instead of the accurate high. If adequately assessed, his suspended sentence for arson in May of 2020 would have likely led to incarceration, thus preventing him from crossing paths with Terry and averting the tragic events. Probation officers who were involved in these oversights would reveal that they were severely overworked and understaffed, and during the inquest, they attributed their challenges to the lack of experienced colleagues in the office due to COVID-19. But worryingly, they would also admit to only reviewing two out of the ten available background reports on Damien. As a result, one of those officers involved in the process lost their jobs due to, quote, gross misconduct. And although Terry, John Paul, Lacey and Connie were the real victims of this case, it was their loved ones that felt the burden. Terry's parents, Angela and Lawrence, expressed seething statements when this inquest was finally made public. In a letter, they said, The probation service failed to protect and keep our family safe. They are now gone. This must never happen again. For many years, they have been failing women and children at risk from violent men with a history of domestic abuse. The senior coroner for Derby also commented on the probation service's weak attempt to blame COVID-19 for their failings. In his own statement, he said, They don't explain the totality of the acts or omissions or failures of the probation service's overview and supervision of Damien Bendel and the decisions made. The probation service acknowledged that they fell short along every step and stage of the process, and pledged that they would review and repair their categorically broken system. In addition to this, they were also provided additional funding to the annual tune of £155 million to help improve their service. And this was under the sole condition that they tighten up their infrastructure and train officers to a higher calibre. But sadly, as we all know, it is too little too late for our four victims and although their deaths may prevent additional ones in the future, this tragedy never should have happened in the first place. Following a service at St. Giles Parish Church, Terry Harris was laid to rest on October the 21st, 2021. Two white horses solemnly pulled her coffin, adorned in the colours of her cherished West Ham. Remembered by her family and friends as a kind woman known for her generous smile, Terry was a devoted and caring mother and a compassionate care worker who went above and beyond to assist those in need. John Paul and Lacey Bennett, along with Connie Gent, had their lives tragically cut short. The deaths of these children are especially poignant, as their potential, dreams, and entire futures were extinguished in an instant. It is particularly hard to accept Connie's death, 
who was merely visiting for a sleepover. Simultaneously, it is thoroughly enraging to know the pure horror Lacey must have experienced as she lay there dying. Each of them had their futures abruptly erased at the hands of a pitiful coward. A career criminal and addict who, with no control over his own life, committed a final and deadly act to end the lives of four innocent individuals. Damien Bendel was a plastic gangster, a wannabe hard man, and an absolute waste of space. This so-called man struggled throughout his life to establish any real value, and merely substituted substance with hollow attempts to appear tough or dangerous. Even mentioning his name does an absolute disservice. He achieved nothing in his sordid little life and thankfully, will never see the light of day again. Instead, our focus should be on remembering those who lost their lives at his hands, and further acknowledging the changes implemented to prevent such a tragedy from occurring again. Although changes in procedure, reallocation of funding, and personal dismissals cannot bring loved ones back, they do represent a step in the right direction moving forward. Following their deaths, neighbours put a memorial plate on the tree outside the family home. The plate said, where angels sang and played, fly high little ones. Nobody was prepared to move into a house which had witnessed so much bloodshed, and so it was decided to permanently board up the property instead. Neighbours of the connecting home were not comfortable sharing walls with a haunted house, so they too requested to be moved. After moving out, Sheffield Council made the decision to tear down the entire property, and now it is an extension of the park that already existed beside it. A fresh cavity in the ground rests as a morbid reminder of the horrors which took place here, but at least over time, grass and flowers will return to the land where this home used to be. What I find odd is that, through no intention whatsoever, I think this is the third or fourth British case in a row that I've covered where the probation service could have prevented these deaths. Anyway folks, this case is absolutely infuriating, and as always, I'd love to know what you think about this one, because for me I just can't get over how much of a monster this guy is. On that note, I'm wrapping this one up here folks, so please leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. As always, thank you so much for being here and watching this video, I really do appreciate you being here. Just a few very short updates for things that are coming up on the channel, but very soon I'll be doing another Q&A video here on YouTube, so keep an eye out on my community posts. In addition to that, if you want to get early access to my videos, be part of a wider Q&A, or get exclusive content, then please check out my Patreon. If you want to see other things that I'm doing outside of true crime, like coffee and travelling, then please check out my Instagram. We're doing lots of other things over there too, such as giveaways. And finally, if you want to grab a bag of my very own coffee, then please check out Classified at classifiedcoffeeco.com. I really do appreciate your support. And yeah, I think that pretty much ends our video today, folks. By the way, I've got so many exciting things coming to Coffeehouse Crime in the coming months. The first one happening in about one or two weeks, where I'm trying to do my very first long-form video of over one hour so please keep up to date on that. We've got lots of really cool things happening, such as Q&As, long-form videos lasting over one hour, and even live reporting on the scene. So, with that said, please stick around for 2024. I can't wait for this year. Anyway, we're back to two videos a week for now, so I'll see you again very soon for another one, folks, likely in three or four days. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.